Welcome back to ECE 442-542. This is the last lecture before exam number three. It's not the last lecture of the semester. I saw a lot of faces getting very bright, thinking that maybe this was the last lecture. No, you're, you're not quite that fortunate. We have some more after exam number three, but we do have a lot of information to give you. I think judging from office hours, it seems like many of you are already wrapping up homework number six, which is good. That's due today. But if you needed some help, I've tried to provide that with some additional D2L material. The exam number three review session will be immediately following this class. And there's also immediately following this class another lecture lecture 6.4 that's already on D2L, meaning hopefully today we will give you the material that you'll have the insight to understand PI controllers. Lecture 6.4 is an example of applying a PI controller. And essentially, we've been worrying about proportional controllers. Now with a PI controller, you have two adjustable parameters. But again, we'll try to formulate that solution in a manner that, again, we're simply adjusting k one knob at a time. We'll pick one of the parameters, which is really a zero, plop that down on our z-plane, and then start adjusting a parameter for the gain. An additional modification to this week, Wednesday is our exam. But prior to that, there are office hours, but somebody's put an appointment on my calendar right at the time that I normally have office hours. So I'm sliding office hours one hour later in the day on this Wednesday. This Wednesday, I apologize if you were planning to come see me at 12.30. I won't be there, but I will be there from 1.30 to 3.30. That's the plan. And as I said, exam number three is the next day that we meet in this classroom on Wednesday. Today what I want to do is basically quickly say what exam three's process is. It's consistent with the other exams. It's just one more sheet of notes, essentially. And then we'll get into sketching the root locus diagram or diagrams, depending on the different systems we play with. By reviewing the proportional controller, we'll, we will introduce the PI controller and discuss its properties. We'll summarize three of the root locus rules. We actually have more root locus rules to come, but those are after or maybe later in the semester. And then we'll go through, through some examples. This is the same process that we've had before. The main difference is the three sheets of notes and maybe the paraphernalia you can bring to the exam. You can bring a protractor, you can bring a compass. If you don't, if you promise me you won't hurt yourself or your neighbor with those implements and a straight edge. You may, I maybe should have brought a straight edge today so that you could nudge me to keep me awake, but Hopefully, we'll get through this class and the review session. But that line, protractor, straight edge, and compass, if you need those to quickly sketch a root locus, you can bring those in. Oh, so the question is, if we have graphically solved the problem, Hopefully it's clear from your graphical solution what you've done, but you might just say solved graphically on your paper. Don't spend too much time telling me, but you can just say graphical solution or solved graphically. And that really for this class is okay. You can say measured with a ruler. If you were somewhat accurate with your sketch, then maybe a ruler will provide you with links that you might need in computing an answer. 
if you so choose instead of trying to punch in all the numbers on a calculator for example did that answer your question this first slide or scroll should be a review this is the proportional controller where our controller capital C of Z is just a gain it's just a K and that gain K we are allowing it to just be non-negative from zero up to infinity just to simplify our life we could let it range from minus infinity to plus infinity but then we'd have to have a dual set of rules for the root loci it's not worth the confusion I think learning it the first time with one sign on K S I G N on K is fine then if you need to you can figure out how to change that if you want K to assume negative values in this class we're gonna go ahead and keep K positive and we usually have whoops just making sure you're awake we're going to have negative output feedback and usually we have no dynamics in the feedback path but if we did we could incorporate those into the appropriate locations on our closed loop transfer function in, in the homework you mentioned uh, like a standard negative unity gain yes what is that so the question was standard unity gain or output feed that's what this is so this is standard i'm saying this is the standard for this class no dynamics in the feedback path and the output is being fed back with a negative and so unity is that transfer function in the feedback path if you said that's a transfer function h h of z has a value of one there's your unity so unity output feedback or unity negative output feedback or standard negative unity output whatever I said hopefully it is consistent with this block diagram what we are focusing on are the closed loop dynamics and they are governed by the denominator of this closed loop transfer function T sub C of Z and you can derive that if you want to based on block diagram algebra but we know it as CG over 1 plus CG PI control let's actually derive that so that we understand where it comes from I'll quickly sort of work through this but you already have the machinery or the tools to do this because you've already know or studied how to find discrete equivalents for the continuous time setting or for the analog case a PI controller takes the air signal and that's the difference between the reference and the output that's E of T and proportionally scales it that's the proportional gain K sub P and with a PI control it also has a parallel path plus a scaled version of the integral of the air that's the K sub I times this integral of the air signal E of T which underneath the integral sign I've introduced this dummy variable tau but this is just a PI controller for the analog scenario or for the analog case that you can transform you can Laplace transform that if you've had a 320 class you know how to Laplace transform a time domain or continuous time expression and that now gives us this K sub P times the Laplace transform of the air K sub P over s that's what the integral looks like in the frequency domain in the s plane and that's time Z here's where if you've forgotten you can go back to the 28th of Decem December the 28th of February I put an extra digit in front of the two I guess but you can now and I was going ahead in time if it's in 2018 okay 
where's that ruler, that straight edge to poke the bear? But it's February 28th when we were doing this class, and we know how to do that many different ways. Let's just apply the forward rule, which is where we replace S everywhere in this expression, not in the arguments of E's and U's. That's just going to convert immediately into Z's, but in the coefficients that scale E's and U's, we will replace S with Z minus 1 over T. That's the forward rule, and that's not too involved because we only have one S floating around in that PI controller. And I've indicated in curly braces that substitution. Now we have K sub P E of Z plus K sub I over the substitution or the discrete equivalent in the frequency domain of S which is z minus 1 over t. And now I'm just going to quickly scroll through some algebra to try to obtain a transfer function between the air signal E and the input U to the plant in the Z domain. That's all I'm doing in the next few lines. So if you get lost, just know that you can take a few minutes later and figure out where this these lines are coming from. First, let me factor out the coefficients that scale E of Z. And that gives us this sum of two terms, K sub P, and I've also put the denominator of the denominator into the numerator. I now have K sub I T over Z minus 1. And that Z minus 1 is really what you kind of want to lock into with a PI controller. Where is that, where does that vanish? Z minus, that Z minus one factor. At one. And that's actually going to give us a pole because it's in the denominator. A PI controller, you immediately put a pole at Z equal one in the Z plane. That's what we're going to find as a consequence of this PI controller in the discrete time setting. Now I'm just getting everything over a common denominator, taking the first term and basically getting that over Z minus 1, so I now need to multiply it by Z minus 1. Distribute that K sub P through both terms. I have K sub P Z minus K sub P plus K sub I T. The last two terms are just constants, and I'm now grouping those with a negative sign in front. Just algebra. And staring at us all the time is this denominator factor, z minus 1. z minus 1. That's a result of the integrator in our PI controller. The only thing that I have done now is factor down a case of P from both terms in the numerator so that I can now have isolated in the numerator expression a gain case of P that I can adjust. I want to be able to adjust a gain like I did in the proportional controller. This now affords me that capability and I've highlighted in yellow what I'm subtracting from Z, and I'm going to just replace that mess of coefficients with a new variable, call it alpha. But if you know the proportional gain, you know the sample period T, and you know the integral gain, you could compute that alpha. What we'll probably do is just find the alpha. And if you needed to, you could back out those other parameters to find Oh, what are the knobs on this PI controller? What's the proportional knob? What's the integral knob? And what was the sample period capital T? The end result is this relationship. Here is our controller. That's a PI controller. Where are the poles in that PI controller? 
it's at 1. That's what we said. So here's the generic structure of a PI controller. And if I say design a PI controller, you can immediately just write down that expression. You can say, oh, I have k sub p, a gain, times a zero factor, z minus alpha, over z minus 1. That pole factor is fixed. What you have the ability to do is adjust two knobs. One of those knobs is the gain of that PI controller. The other is the location of a real zero on the real line. You now have the ability to determine by your engineering expertise where you want to put that zero, what the alpha value is going to be. And here are some points to make. We have a fixed pole at z equal 1 that results from a PI controller. We have an adjustable zero location. And we have an adjustable gain. And again, we'll keep that k non-negative, just to keep things straightforward. Alpha, the question was the same with alpha, not necessarily. Now we'll let alpha be whatever we want, from minus infinity to plus infinity. But what do you never want to do with that alpha? You could make it 1, and then you would have what kind of a controller? A proportional controller. So now your boss goes, well, I just bought this PI controller. And you go, well, we didn't need the I. And she'll go, who said I? And you'll say, OK, well, I'll, we'll see if we can introduce an integral term. Maybe. But if you picked alpha equal to 1, you would now be defaulting into a proportional controller. But we will go ahead and allow alpha to move along the real line from negative infinity to positive infinity so that we have a real zero wherever we want on the real line when we say a PI controller. But what we don't want that alpha to do is cancel a pole on the z-plane outside the unit circle. So we never, ever, ever, we learned that from Ragazzini. That's one reason for studying Ragazzini. We do not ever want to cancel a pole or zero outside the unit circle. We can cancel them all we want inside the unit circle. Did I see a hand? Okay, I don't know what the question was, but I answered it. Must have been a great answer. I doubt it, but I'm guessing you said, can we cancel inside the unit circle? And the answer is yes. We can cancel poles and zeros inside the unit circle. And we do that to actually simplify our analysis, and it's okay to do that. And it may simplify the, the resulting system. Let's just quickly read through some of the properties of the PI controller. One is the PI controller puts a pole at z equal 1. If you're thinking back to an analog control class, now you're in digital control and you now placed a pole at z equal to 1, what would that have been consistent with in the S-plane? Where is z equal 1 mapped into the S-plane? It's DC, and so in the S-plane, where is DC? Zero, at the origin. S equals zero. So you would have had a pole at the origin in the S-plane. That's a pure integrator. Here is an integrator in the Z-plane. That's a pole at Z equal to one. So which one are we at talking about? In the S-domain or the Z-domain? So in the S domain, if we wanted, what is the equivalent location in the S plane in the Z plane? It's this relationship between S equals 0, the origin, and Z equal 1 in the Z plane. So E to the S T. Remember E to the S capital T. And if we let S equal 0, that gives us Z equal to 1.
But the reason we're doing that is because it helps our steady state accuracy. If we wanted to track a constant, then putting that integrator in there, putting that pole at one, will allow us to lock on to a constant reference input if we can stabilize the system. We need to make sure that the closed loop system is stable. Once that's true, then if we have a pole at the or I'm sorry, a pole at z equal to one, if we have an integrator, then we will be able to track that constant reference input. It improves steady state accuracy, but if you're now plopping a pole at z equal to one, what have you done to your transient, maybe? Where is z equal to one relative to the stability boundary? It's right on the stability boundary, isn't it? So we've probably made our job a little more difficult in making the transient behavior better. This, that's this trade-off between steady state accuracy and transient behavior. So now the question was, if you have a pole at z equal to 1, isn't that unstable? Well, that's an open loop pole, and we're concerned with the closed loop poles. So we, are, we need to make sure that we distinguish between closed loop system behavior and what we're doing in the open loop system. So we can put an open loop pole at z equal 1 as long as we can stabilize that system in the closed loop. And that pole in the open loop helps us for steady state accuracy. So tracking is simply if I put in a constant then in the steady state after the transient I want to be locked on. I want to track that constant. That's what I'm meaning by tracking. I'm just tracking. So if you now we're wanting to go, if you were flying an airplane and you said go to 20 degrees, you, want, you would want to track at 20 degrees. You would want to be flying at 20 degrees. That's the tracking. If you wanted to drive always at a particular angle or if you wanted to drive down a straightaway, you would want to track that straightaway. That's just a new term, term but you don't have to get too hung up on that term. The second property of the PI is that you now have two parameters to play with. An adjustable zero location, which now in the 541 class or the 441 class, I would say, oh, we have our zero shaker and our pole shaker, and we can shake those how we want to enhance the behavior of our system. Just like you have a salt shaker and a pepper shaker, maybe to enhance your food, now we have zeros and poles to enhance the behavior of our dynamical system. Here's our block diagram of a PI controller. When I say PI controller, boom, you can immediately put that transfer function in your block diagram for the controller. It's K times Z minus alpha over Z minus one, and you now need to determine what is alpha and what is k bar. But the way that we are going to design is essentially to realize that, oh, I could actually slide that z minus alpha factor into the plant box and I could slide that z minus one pole factor into the plant box now I simply have an adjustable gain k bar. Once I've fixed alpha, once I've selected an alpha, g bar of z is fixed, and now I'm back to my standard root locus block diagram configuration. Even though now I have a PI controller that I'm playing with. But now this is why we spent time learning how to design with a root locus is it now plays the same with this PI controller. After you've selected 
this zero location, this alpha value. For this particular block diagram, again, it's just CG over 1 plus CG. You can't forget that until after you finish this class, at least, maybe even your entire working career. And some of you will retire early, maybe in a couple of years, so it won't be that long. Some of you might remember this for a long time. That's fine. It's CG over 1 plus CG. And now if we slide those two factors into the plant, the augmented plant box, we now have a G bar so that now we have K bar G bar over 1 plus K bar G bar. And that is what we want to worry about. We want to deal with the closed loop dynamics that are governed by the denominator of that closed loop transfer function. We've changed it a little bit because now we have two adjustable parameters. We have a PI controller to hopefully allow us to achieve better behavior, whatever better behavior means in your particular scenario. We're back to the root locus design. And those are the values of Z. If I ask you to describe to one of your peers in this classroom, what is the root locus diagram, do, would you have a one sentence statement for them? What's the Z or what's the root locus? What does that represent? oh, we're studying the root locus diagram, and your eyes just roll back in your head. No, you, they shouldn't. You should just be able to say, the root locus diagram, oh, it's just the red branches on the z-plane. Well, yeah, but a little bit more, maybe. It's the closed loop, it's the potential closed loop poles of your system. That's what the red branches represent in the z-plane, the potential closed-loop poles. And some of those could be unstable. What you're hoping is that simultaneously all of the po closed-loop poles end up inside the unit circle, and two that dominate, you hope, give you the behavior that you want. And the others, if you had ten more, they're faster than those dominant ones, and so you kind of neglect those. We're focusing again on 1 plus k bar g bar equaling 0. And if we go ahead and agree on this notation that we've lumped everything in this augmented plant, the numerator polynomial we will call little n of z, the denominator polynomial of g bar we will call d of z, then we can rewrite 1 plus k bar g bar equivalently as d plus k n over d equaling zero. And when does this right-hand side vanish, or right-hand equation vanish, relative to when 1 plus k bar g bar vanishes? What do we want to fix or focus on in this right-hand expression relative to we want 1 plus k, or we want to find the values of z, we want those red branches on the z-plane, we want to know where they're located, and we know that they satisfy 1 plus k bar g bar of z equaling 0, what does that translate into on the right-hand equation? The numerator, d plus k bar n equaling 0. And now we can see what happens as we adjust k bar from 0 to infinity. If k bar is 0, what values of z cause that to vanish? 
If k bar is 0, now just cover up that term, and what do you have? d of z equal, just concentrate on the numerator, just fix on, focus on the numerator, then you have d of z equaling 0. And those are your open loop poles. That's where we start with our root locus. As k bar gets big, then k bar n of z dominates in the numerator, and what values of z cause that to vanish? The values of z that cause n of z to vanish, because k bar n of z is dominating that numerator polynomial. And that numerator gives us our closed loop poles. That terminology now allows us to derive all of these rules. Yes, so we haven't, we're now saying this 1 plus k bar g bar is going to depend on what k, g bar is. Yes, so g bar is the augmented plant. So that includes everything other than the gain. So we've just factored out the gain. Here are three rules for the root locus sketching. Rule one, what is that really? Well, it's just identifying these two polynomials, n of z and d of z, and plotting x's and o's. The beginning values of your root locus and the ending values. That's the first rule. That's easy. Actually, all three of these are pretty straightforward or easy. Rule two, it's what happens after you've cut the bread. You have this infinite real axis, and you've now segmented it according to where you have poles and zeros. Rule two says which of those real axis segments belong to the root locus. And the quick way to do that is you simply go to one of those segments and you look right. And when you look right, do you say, do I count an odd number of poles and zeros to my right? If yes, then that line segment belongs to the root locus. That's rule two. And that's all because comes from the phase angle condition. You can justify that rule by looking at the phase angle condition. Rule number three, breakaway and reentry points. And this really only exists between two poles or two zeros where you have these breakaway or reentry. You could have breakaway without reentry, you could have reentry without breakaway. But here, the breakaway points and the reentry points on the real line, and where are those going to occur? The breakaway and reentry can only occur on the real line segments that are a part of the root locus. You can't have a breakaway where the root locus is not. You can't have a reentry where the root locus doesn't exist. That's the only possibility for breakaway and reentry, and we have this special case, two poles and a zero. I just like saying that. That sounds like I'm starting a joke. Two poles and a zero walk into a bar. No, two poles and a zero end up on the z-plane with two poles, real poles, to the right of one real zero. You finish the joke. The joke, it's really not a joke. Now you know that you have a circle. Now you have a geometry problem. Now you can use your compass. The zero is going to be the center of that circle, and the radius of that circle is determined by the geometric mean of two lengths. And that's a pretty easy sketch. But with that two pole and a zero special configuration, 
you've already by default figured out where your breakaway point is and where your reentry point is. So the geometric mean is just going to be these two. So you now have this length, there's L1 between the zero and the closest pole, and you have length L2. using this zero as your end point and the farthest pole as your second point. And the geometric mean or your radius r is now the square root of L1 times L2. Question? So, so what do I mean by relative? So relative gain is relative to that line segment or that interval. So relative gain between, let's say, these two poles, you're starting at zero at the two poles, and what happens? As you crank up the gain, the leftmost pole moves right, the rightmost pole moves, moves less as you're cranking up the gain. You keep cranking up the gain, and what happens? Where they hit, that's the maximum, that's the relative max of the gain along that line segment. So if you plotted K between those two poles, you would see sort of this hump in your K magnitude. The magnitude, you could do that on your calculator. If you had a calculator, you could plug in the formula for K, evaluate K absolute value of K along that line segment and look for where's the maximum. Boom, there's my relative max and that's the breakaway point. You're correct in that what happens? Maybe they break away at 27.2. Then at 28, they're complex, aren't they? 100, 200, I'm just using arbitrary numbers. It's not going to be that for here, but now it's at 207. Then what happens? Well, 207 is the relative min along that line segment because any value of gain bigger than 207, one branch is going to go to the right towards that finite zero. The other branch is going to go to the left towards negative infinity. So relative to that line segment is what I'm meaning by relative max and relative min. Did that help? All right, now we can start playing. Here's the fun part. So let's play with proportional and proportional and integral, or P and PI controllers, for a particular system. And let's examine this system now for proportional control where we have a gain K and our plant is 1 over Z. The first thing we may want to do is determine the range of K for stability. Is this plant in the closed loop configuration, can I adjust that K arbitrarily and still remain stable? That's the question we want to address first. So let's look at the range. of K for closed loop stability. And we could solve this many, many, many different ways. But let's now just kind of work through this problem the way that I've decided to work through it for now. So that maybe it's a different approach than what we've looked at before. What's the closed loop transfer function that you were supposed to remember until you retire? CG over 1 plus CG, right? Which in this case C is K, so we'll just go ahead and do that. We'll say KG over 1 plus K 
g of z. And what determines closed loop stability in that rational expression? The denominator. So now we are focusing on the denominator of that closed loop transfer function to determine the range of k for closed loop stability. The denominator now says that we have 1 plus k, and I'm going to go ahead and substitute in the specific expression for g of z, which is 1 over z. And we want to know now what values of k allow this to produce roots inside the unit circle. Or we can now put those two pieces over a common denominator. And now we're interested in the numerator of the denominator, which is this z plus k equaling 0. So the numerator of the denominator will influence closed loop stability so that now we have z plus k equaling 0. And in fact, what we want to do is we want to select the gain k, that knob, to keep the roots of z plus k inside the unit circle. That's one way of thinking about it. We now want to find what values of k will allow the roots of that polynomial to have values of z inside the unit circle. Or, another way of thinking about this is to say, oh, if 1 plus k g of z is equal to 0, I can solve that for k g of z. by subtracting 1 from both sides and minus 1 is a distance 1 into the left half z plane at an angle of 180 degrees or we can get there minus 180 and we've agreed let's just all be consistent and say we're at minus 180 on our angle. So now we know that kg of z must be 1 at minus 180, and there's two conditions that are screaming at us from that equation. If we look at the magnitude condition, We know that the magnitude of the left-hand side has to equal 1. And here's why we're going ahead and simplifying our life. If we say, let's just keep k non-negative, then we don't need to worry about it influencing our phase in that k g of z expression. So now g of z's angle is minus 180 degrees. And those are the two conditions. Pardon? These are forced on us by looking at this equation, 1 plus k g of z equal to 0. And that 1 plus k g of z is determining our closed loop behavior. So those are forced on us. In fact, yes, they're given, but they are a result of examining the denominator. Let's now look at the magnitude condition.
and assuming that k is non-negative, let's factor that out, and now we see that we have k times the magnitude of g equaling 1, and for this particular system, g of z was just 1 over z, and now we're going to play with the product of magnitudes. We could say the magnitude of the numerator divided by the magnitude of the denominator is equal to the magnitude of the whole thing, or we can now say that k times 1 over the magnitude of z is equal to 1. or multiplying both sides through by the magnitude of z, we now know that k is equal to the magnitude of z. There's our formula for the magnitude of the gain k. That's our knob. What's the root locus of this system look like? And I needed a compass to draw that, but I didn't have one, so I didn't want to damage my tablet, did I, with that needle that's at the center of my compass, so I now am sketching that by hand. There's my unit circle. What's the root locus of this system look like? The system, do we remember what g of z was? Wow. g of z was 1 over z. So now we find the finite zeros and the finite poles in G of Z. And according to rule number one, we plot those on the Z plane. Where are my open circles? I don't have any. Where are my open or where are my crosses or X's? I just have one pole. How many closed loop poles do I have? One. How many branches of the root locus do I have? One. So I don't care if you start counting on your fingers or holding your fingers in the air during the exam to remind you what you have. So what, what is the, branch number of branches? the branches of the root locus equals the number of closed loop poles you have. And in this case, you have one pole, one X, that's going to give rise to one branch. Rule two, we have a long piece of bread. How many real axis segments do we have? Two, we have the positive side and the negative side. Do both of those segments belong to the root locus? No, we could go over to uh, some place in the right-hand side and stand on the real line and say, how many poles and zeros are to my right? Zero, so that's not belonging to the root locus. The root locus is everything over there. Those are the potential closed-loop poles. Now, we may not be happy with all of those poles, but this is where we would have closed-loop poles if somebody continued to twist that gain knob, K, from zero all the way up to infinity. We would have one pole, and it would march from zero all the way to minus infinity as we adjusted the gain, K. I'm not looking to the left. So the question was, which direction do I look? I'm looking to the right because that's how I'm defining my angle. My angle is defined relative to the positive real line uh, from each singularity. In this case, the only singularity I have is this pole. And now I look from this positive real part, I look to the right. Well, in this case, I'm standing here and I'm looking that direction. 
and I don't see anything. Now I'm standing here and I look this direction and I see one pole to my right. That means that this segment over here belongs to the root locus. Where do my root locus branches begin? So the question was, how do we know that the root locus arrow is going to the left? The arrow points in the positive direction of K, or how K is increasing, and K begins at the open loop poles, and it ends at the zeros, and in this case it's ending at an infinite zero, since we don't have any finite zeros. So as K increases, that's the direction of that arrow, and that's going to the left. Where were we? Oh, we want to know now, can we identify the range of K that will produce closed-loop stability? If K is equal to zero, is my system stable? Yes. Where is my system ever going to be unstable? Do we see that once I exit the unit circle, once I crank up the gain K to get to that box, any point of K beyond that is unstable? That's going to then be how I can determine my maximum gain value for stability. Or now I'm looking at K, let's say K box, which is K when Z is equal to minus 1. That's now, I said the expression for K is just the magnitude of Z. I evaluate that at minus 1. And this is getting very difficult in terms of the math. What's the magnitude of minus 1? Okay, now I need my straight edge. But now we have k box is 1. That's the upper, that's the maximum value of gain for stability. And in this particular case, I have a stable system. for k between 0 and 1. And in fact, if I wanted to sort of be, if I just wanted to look at the open loop system, if I got rid of the control, I would get rid of the k, and I would just con have an open loop system, and I would have what you could consider k equal to 0, but now you're just looking at this particular piece of your diagram. You're not feeding anything back and you don't have a K and that would be like K equal to zero. So in this case your system is really stable for K between zero and one, up to one. The number of what? The number of segments in that root locus. Is it always going to be like the number of like closed loop being transferred from means plus one? So now we have two different pieces of information. We have real axis segments and we have branches of the root locus that we have to keep track of. The number of real line segments is determined by how many poles and zeros we have on the real line. That will determine how many pieces of bread we have. The number of root locus branches equals the number of poles. So the number of root locus branches equals the number of poles and how many segments of the real axis belong to the root locus is dependent on 
rule number two. I can't say any particular algorithm. It just depends on how many poles and zeros are to my right. If it's an odd number, then that segment belongs to the root locus. And that segment could possess multiple branches of the root locus. In this case, I have two real line segments. One of those belongs on the real on the root locus in this example. So let's move on. Suppose now we have stability between 0 and 1 for k. What if I picked k equal to 1 half? Suppose k is equal to 1 half. Is my closed loop stable? I just derived that. As long as k was between 0 and 1, I'm stable in the closed loop. You can actually now compute the closed loop transfer function. It was kg over 1 plus kg, which was k over z over 1 plus k over z, introducing the particular value for g getting a common denominator in the denominator gives me then and canceling that common denominator my closed loop transfer function is k over z plus k which for k equal to one half gives me that expression for t sub c of z if I'm now in the closed loop with a gain of one half and somebody walks up and kicks that system, what's the transient going to, what's the structure of the transient? If somebody now initializes the mode, based, that's what I'm meaning by walking up and kicking the system, and it's in a closed loop configuration, what's the structure of the transient? How's it going to shake? Alpha times what? The mode is the value of z that causes that denominator or values of z that cause the denominator to vanish. In this case, z equal to minus one half causes that denominator to vanish. This is my transient behavior. Found from that. Is that going to be pretty? No. It's going to be bouncing back and forth. It will be collapsing because it has a magnitude less than one, but it may not be a very pretty response. So let's just say this may be ugly. But that's okay. It's still stable. What's the DC gain? with, let's say, k equal to one-half. And how do I find the DC gain? I substitute z equal to one where? So now I evaluate this closed-loop transfer function at z equal to one. That's my DC gain. In this case, it's 1 half over 1 plus 1 half. Or my DC gain is 1 third. So what's my steady state error? My steady state error is my steady state 
input value, which is, let's say, one, let's say I just put in a unit step, and I compare that with the steady state output. Will I reach a steady state output? I'm bouncing back and forth, but eventually it's going to get very, very tiny. So I will. This is now 1 minus T sub C of Z, my DC gain, times the unit step, 1. So this is now 1 minus 1 third, or my steady state error is 2 thirds. I put in 1, and where did I end up? What did my output, steady state output, where did I end up? I said, go to 1, and where did I go to? I went to one-third because I had an eventual error of two-thirds between where I wanted to go and where I ended up. So that may or may not be acceptable. That's going to depend on what your system is, whether you can tolerate that large of an error, steady-state error. Suppose it's not acceptable. You want to track what you put in. You want to put in one and get to one and lock on to one after the transient. You want maybe zero steady state air. Well, that means that maybe we need to change the structure of our controller. We just applied a proportional controller. Now we have more tools in our toolbox to play with. Let's change the controller structure. And the, contro control, uh, the controller structure that we want to do is the PI control. Why? Because that actually now improves our steady state accuracy. I'm going to say it enhances steady state accuracy. So if we had part A was the proportional control, now it's example 3B, the PI control. We can quickly, if we wanted to, sketch the block diagram. We had K, Z minus alpha over Z minus 1. That's our PI controller. That's our C of Z. When somebody says PI control, boom, we can put that structure immediately down. Our plant, let's play with the same plant. That was this 1 over Z. And we are interconnecting that in our standard block diagram configuration with unity feedback negative comparison with the reference input R. Again, we can compute the closed loop transfer function because we have it memorized, CG over 1 plus CG. And we know what influences our closed loop dynamics. What piece of T sub C of Z governs the closed loop dynamics? The denominator. So we now are focusing on 1 plus C of Z, G of Z, equaling 0. And for our particular case, we now have 1 plus K times CG, well, that's now Z minus alpha over Z, 
z minus 1 equaling 0. Here is our augmented plant. There is our g bar of z. If we wanted now to look at the magnitude condition, we're looking at the values of z that cause that to vanish or to be true for particular values of alpha and k. What's the magnitude condition expression? The magnitude of what equals, so the magnitude of kg of z equals 1. So now we have k, z minus alpha over z, z minus 1 equaling 1. We'll assume k is non-negative. So we can pull that out from the absolute value sign and solve for k. And now everything that was in the denominator, those factors, we can take their absolute value and put those in the numerator, or we're just cross-multiplying. We now have the magnitude of z, magnitude of z minus 1, all over the magnitude of z minus alpha. That's what we get when we do the magnitude condition. So now, given an alpha value, fix it, and we can now determine, based on values of z, what k is, what our knob is set at. Now, I've never, hopefully, I hopefully have never included the k in g bar. So now I had k g bar of z, and that was what influenced k g bar, is everything but the k. So now g bar is going to be whatever it needs to be so that it encompasses all of the factors other than the gain k. That's how we're defining g bar. So g bar is going to be whatever it is for our particular choice of plant and controller. And it could be different depending on the application or the system. In this case, this is what our k is. And let's just experiment with some potential alphas, some different values of alpha. Let's let alpha equal something for this example. And depending on what we choose for alpha, let's go ahead and sketch the appropriate root locus. Suppose we let alpha equal 0. What happens if we let alpha equal to 0? Then we have, the same, we have a z magnitude upstairs and downstairs. Those cancel. Is that OK? Let's look at the root locus. Here's our root locus. Where was our pole of the plant? What was our plant? G of z was equal to 1 over z. We had a pole right there in our z plane. We put a PI controller in place, and do we now have any more poles present? Here is our g bar of z. Now we plot d of z as x's, and we plot n of z as o's. d of z, we've already put the one pole at the origin. We put the other one at 1. That's due to the integrator in our PI controller, and now where do we put the zero, the open circle?
and now we're setting alpha equal to zero. So where do we put the zero? Right on top of the pole. Is that okay? Where's that cancellation? Where, by saying where, I'm saying is it inside the unit circle or outside the unit circle? Inside. If I cancel inside, that's okay. So it depends on what I've said. If I had G of Z as the plant, then it would just be G. But I could also say that was G bar. So it's, it's whatever is in the expression. In this case, I had 1 plus K G bar. The magnitude condition is based on 1 plus K G bar. If I had 1 plus K G equals 0, the magnitude condition is the magnitude of K G is equal to 1. It depends, so don't get hung up too much on notation. Just concentrate on what you've now determined is in your denominator expression. In this case, where were we? Now we have the question, is alpha equal to zero okay? Where was the cancellation? Inside or outside the unit circle? Inside. That's okay. We can cancel poles and zeros inside the unit circle. We just never want to cancel outside. We can also put poles and zeros outside the unit circle. We just can't use them to cancel anything outside the unit circle. This is OK. Now what's my magnitude or my expression for K? What does it equal? That's just k is equal to the magnitude of z minus 1. And what's, what's the root locus of this look like? Now you can literally put some certain glasses on and not even see that pole 0 cancellation. You could sort of virtually erase that and just draw your root locus based on what's remaining. And now we know how to draw a root locus with one pole. That's the root locus. And where do I need to get nervous about cranking up the gain K? As long as I stay to the right of that box, I'm OK with my gain K. So I can find the upper bound on stability by evaluating this when z is equal to minus 1. At k equals 0, I'm right on the stability boundary because I'm right at the pole at z equal to 1. So I want k to be positive and less than whatever this ends up being. This is going to be k box. So now I have the magnitude of minus 2, which is 2. For stability, I now have 0 is less than k is less than 2. That's just one choice of alpha. Maybe you don't like that choice. Or actually, let's just experiment. Suppose we pick alpha equal to minus 1. What's the root locus look like now? And my plant at the origin pole, I had a PI controller, so that put a pole at 1. And where is my 0 located? Where alpha is, which is minus 1, now I have this guy. Two poles and a 0 walk into a bar. Right? You know how to draw this root locus. This root locus, rule 2 gives us that. 
and we can use the fact that this is now a circle centered at the zero and where they break away is the geometric mean associated with these two poles. We have one times two, the square root of that. The square root of two is the total radius of this circle. I now have a radius of 1.4 and the center is going to be at minus one. So if I could say that's at 0.414, I now have this. That's supposed to be a circle. And all of that now, oh, this is supposed to be a circle too. <laughs> That's why you can bring a compass if you want. But let's just quickly determine what are the bounds for stability. Where do I start? Can I start a little bit bigger than zero? If I do, I have those two branches coming together. Where do I start becoming unstable with the gain K? Do you see right where that actually exits the unit circle? So this is going to be K diamond. And you could actually, what was the radius of that circle? Square root of 2. I have a triangle here. The horizontal side is 1. I have the hypotenuse as the square root of 2 and the other opposite side is at J or 1 in length. That's exactly where I cross that unit circle. And you could find what the value, and in fact, K delta or K diamond he ends up one. So for that choice of alpha, I now have stability between zero and one. I would now suggest that you go home and play, well, maybe later go home, but alpha equal to one half and see what that gives you. We'll stop at that point. We could go on. We have an infinite choice of alphas. But maybe some of these look better than others for your particular situation. But they will all give you a PI controller. So they will give you good steady state accuracy. And that you need to know for the exam.